Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is James Banting. Uh, I'm with a company called Spark Geo, uh, and we have a little bit of a problem in uh, central British Columbia in Canada. Uh, we have a lot of Sasquatch roaming around the, the wilds there. So this talk will be about how we used um, open source geospatial tools, uh, cloud native concepts to detect Sasquatch in the wilds of Canada. Uh, so what is Sasquatch? Well, some people might be familiar with the terms uh, Bigfoot, Abominable Snowman, Yeti. Um, these are all thought to be an early human variant called Human Sapiens Cognatus. Uh, they're usually char characterized by being very large, very hairy, uh, um, and they live out in the wild, out in the forests. Uh, Bonneville snowmen and yeti typically live in high mountain areas, and as a result, their fur is usually white. Uh, in, in British Columbia, um, we have a couple of high mountains, but they're usually kind of in the, the lower mountain areas, so their fur is usually light brown, a uh, little, little easier to see uh, against some snow. Um, there have been a couple of reported sightings and a few images captured like this, but you know, nothing really concrete. Um, can't really prove that Sasquatch exists. So that was one of the things that, that we set out to do was get some geospatial proof that Sasquatch are actually real. Um, so as I mentioned, in, in early this year in March, we had been hearing reports of Sasquatch in and around Prince George, British Columbia, some in Prince George. Uh, and that's where we're, we're headquartered, or our headquarters are. So we thought, you know, we're, we're a geospatial tech company we have expertise in remote sensing and cloud native approaches and, and really building pipelines to, to do this sort of thing for not necessarily Sasquatches, but, but other objects. So let's try and help the community and find some, some Sasquatches. Uh, we, we settled on a hierarchical approach um, where we would get some medium resolution imagery and use that with the classification and typical remote sensing pre-processing stuff to try and inform us where we should buy some high resolution imagery to really look for, for Sasquatch. Um, you know, once we get that high resolution imagery, we'd sprinkle some AI on it and out would come our Sasquatch. It seemed like a, a pretty logical approach. Uh, I discussed it with the team and everyone was on board. So, so we went ahead with the, uh, with the plan to detect individual Sasquatch from satellite imagery. Um, so we started out by using, by using a stack API. This one is from development seed. Uh, we have our own implementation. There's a couple other companies who have their own implementation of, of uh, a Stack API. Um, and we used it to search for, um, search for imagery that was relevant to us. So if you're not familiar with, uh, with Stack or Spatial Temporal Asset Catalog, um, Matt Hansen is giving a talk on this on Friday morning. Well, he'll, he'll go a little bit more in depth on, on Stack. Uh, I'm just going to provide a kind of an overview. Uh, there's, there's really three components to Stack. There's the metadata model, um, where we standardize ways to capture, uh, you know, things like, like uh, um, capture angle, uh, cloud cover, ground sampling distance, different, different aspects of, of geospatial raster data. Uh, and we provide standard fields to, uh, or simple fields to, to, uh, to, to access that data. Um, there's two variants. There's a static catalog that kind of is kind of a sidecar to uh, to the actual data. It can live beside the data, or it can it can be on its own. Uh, it's indexable and it's crawlable. Uh, and then all, there's the dynamic API where you can search on arbitrary fields and and play around with whatever. Uh, it's it's uh, WFS compatible, so it it rides along the WFS spec from OGC. Um, it's really really easy to start searching for geospatial data. Uh, as I mentioned, Matt Hansen's giving a talk on Friday, so go check that one out. Uh, but yeah, we use Stack API to search for, for satellite data, really in our area of interest and based on the features that, that we wanted to identify. Um, so we're looking for free, medium resolution, uh, medium to high resolution imagery. Uh, luckily, AWS provides this through their open data program. Um, they have Stack catalogs for Sentinel-2 and Landsat-8. So uh, development seed ingested it into their SAT API. Uh, I just used Postman to, uh, to do a quick query on it. Uh, I have a uh, polygon, uh, GeoJSON polygon, uh, the collections that I want to search for. I want to look on both Landsat and Sentinel. 
uh, my time parameter. So I'll, you know, these reports that we were hearing were at the beginning of this year. So I want to look in January to March or to, to April, and then some of those finer grained um, parameters that I want to look at. In this case, cloud cover less than 40% or, or 0.4. Um, so this really narrowed down our area, uh, narrowed down our, our search parameters, and we were able to come out with, uh, with five images, uh, which is kind of cool. So the first one was a Landsat scene, and all the, the Landsat data on AWS is available as a COG, a cloud-optimized geotiff. Um, COGs permit pretty easy viewing. I don't have to download the entire image if I only want to look at a little, little area of it. Uh, and I can also grab the actual file location from Stack. Uh, so up at the top there is the, the file location on S3. I can put it into um, something like COG EO map. Uh, it's a, a free service put up there from, um, from the COG working group. And I can view the COG right in my browser without actually having to, to download anything. Uh, it's perfect. If I find an area that I am interested in, uh, through COG, I can do range requests and download the native resolution for that specific area rather than downloading the entire file. So it works really well when I don't have uh, a really good internet connection when I'm hunting for Sasquatch physically. Uh, so the, you know, Landsat was a, was a good data set. Um, it, really, it really helped me see what was around there. I needed a little bit higher spatial resolution, so I wasn't able to, uh, to use Landsat for this, so I went with, uh, with Sentinel. And fortunately, we had four Sentinel scenes to choose from. Um, you know, this one's we can get a little bit higher spatial resolution. So rather than the, uh, the 30 meter that, that Landsat would provide, uh, I can go down to the 15 meter from, from Sentinel 2. So after I selected the scene that was most appropriate, I downloaded it. Um, and I actually downloaded a digital elevation model at the same time. And I know from, uh, from reading some literature, doing a, uh, a pretty in-depth literature review, that Sasquatch like to live in uh, the Alpine region, so not, not really in the basin, not behind the mountain. So I use that to do a clip uh, of the Sentinel-2 data, just so that I don't have as much data to send to my AI. Uh, it makes it a lot easier to process. Um, I did a, uh, a really rudimentary k-means, so I was just clustering, trying to identify sparse forest. Uh, Sasquatch like to look around there. Uh, do some hunting, uh, you know, there's rabbits floating around there, so they, they grabbed them there. Um, it, was, it was very rudimentary. We had some problems with shadows with the K-means, but that's okay. I, I need, just needed to, to get a, a really smaller area so that I could buy some high-resolution imagery. Uh, so once I had the area of interest that I was, uh, that I was really interested in, um, I went to uh, GBDX. This is kind of the only part that's not really open source. Uh, I went to GBDX and downloaded some Worldview 2 imagery. Uh, I ran it through GBDX, or got it through GBDX and did some pan sharpening it to get, to get uh, a little higher resolution uh, from the pan band. Um, so once I did that, I sprinkled my, my AI across it, and lo and behold, I was able to find uh, Sasquatch, a whole herd of them, uh, sitting out in the mountains. So it was, it was concrete proof that you know, Sasquatch were terrorizing the citizens of Prince George, British Columbia. Uh, everyone was le relieved. We were heroes. We had a parade. Uh, it, was, it was really, really good. Um, you know, after some, uh, some cleanup on the image, and uh, we kind of broke some laws of physics and did some quite extraordinary image enhancement, uh, we were able to, uh, to really see the Sasquatch and start identifying body parts and you know, we can get down a facial res recognition layer. Um, that might be a, a later task. We've got to find some funding for that, but uh, we'll see. The government was pretty interested in that. Um, so, yeah, that was, that was our project. Uh, we were heroes in, in Prince George, British Columbia. Um, so, obviously, this project was, was fun, and we did it for April Fool's Day. Uh, everyone on board was, or everyone on the team was, was on board with this, because we do, we do this stuff for, for our jobs but we wanted to have a little more fun with it. Um, now, I can't speak for the rest of the team, but I don't think Sasquatch exists. <laughs> maybe, I mean, maybe the rest of the team does, but, uh, but I'm not on board with that. Uh, and the, the goal of this project really was, besides being fun, was to highlight some of the cloud-native approaches that we can take to, to get imagery. 
uh, and to get remote sensing um, data and process it. So we want to show things like stack and we want to show things like cogs and to an extent ARD, uh, analysis ready data, and we want to show how easy it is to manipulate remote sensing data um, without proprietary software. So that was fun, but there's also some broader implications of the work that, uh, that we put into this project. Um, so besides Stack, COG, and, and ARD, which are all valuable contributing factors to the project, um, we wanted to, to kind of play around with some synthetic training data for machine learning as well. Uh, so after we did this project, we're like, okay, this is, this is cool. Can we take it a little bit further and can we expand on it? Um, and can we, can we make it uh, um, easier for uh, machine learning tasks that don't necessarily have a lot of training data, can we substitute that with some synthetic data? Um, so this is how we faked creating it, and hopefully this informs you guys if you're, if you're interested in creating synthetic training data, um, something approach like this. Um, so after, after looking through the stack API and, and doing the hierarchical classification and getting, getting a base image, uh, you know, we grabbed some imagery uh, from, from the internet, in this case, uh, a Sasquatch. Um, and I think that's a rug underneath that we just put a Sasquatch image on top, the face on top. But if you want to identify things like, uh, I'm gonna use cars, the old easy example, uh, a specific color of cars or something like that, you can get them off the internet, you can put them uh, on, on your, uh, your training sample and start using those to identify cars. There's a lot of data about cars, so it, it's probably not the best example, um, but if you're identifying some, some feature that there's only a specific, uh, a limited number of, of examples, this would be a, a good use case. Um, so as I mentioned, we downloaded it from GBDX. We did pan sharpening to en enhance the resolution, clipped out our area, and we have a, a data set that that's ready to go. Um, if we're doing this for training data, obviously we like different geographic regions. Uh, we'd like different um, um, environments, different illumination angles. Just try to get as much variety as possible. Uh, so some of the tools that, uh, that we used, uh, we used X-Array to kind of abstract the geospatial components so that it was easy to work with. Um, X-Array is great for high dimensional data. Uh, so if you have a lot of, um, say, climate data and it's, it's time stamped, it's really easy through X-Ray to, to identify and pull out specific time, uh, time periods. Um, uh, it, was, it was probably overkill for this project, but it was, it was, uh, it was good to use it. Uh, we also used HollowView. Uh, all this was done within a Jupyter Notebook. Um, HollowView is, is great for visualizing your data really quickly. It allows some, some interactive tools, so you can zoom in, you can start playing around and clicking all within the, uh, the notebook. Uh, and then obviously, rest your I.O. through, through X-Ray to, to bring in the, the geospatial component. Um, so one of the first things that we had to do was resample the image of Sasquatch. Uh, the pixel resolution didn't match that of the Sentinel-2 or the Worldview 2 data. Um, so we had to resample that and we'll lose some of the, uh, the uh, resolution on there, but that's okay. Our, our subsequent um, AI cleaned that up and identified the, part, the body parts for us. But uh, yeah, once we, once we have the same, special res, same spatial resolution, we can start to, to overlay those images and kind of do a, a mosaic. Uh, we're, we're just burning that image on top of the world view too. Um, if you're doing a full mosaic, you'd want to do things like histogram matching and do some feathering and transition zones if it's, if it's going to be a, uh, um, a visual product. If it's analytic, you obviously don't want to change the data too much. Um, so, so, as I mentioned, we did it in a, in a Jupyter notebook. Uh, we grabbed a, uh, uh, the Sasquatch image, we scaled them down, made them to the same resolution. Uh, we darkened them a little bit to, to kind of simulate shadows. Uh, we rotated them so that we could have a herd of Sasquatch lying around in a, in a specific area. Um, and we put them on the, the same coordinate system as the Worldview 2 image so that they'll align properly. Uh, if you're using this for training data, you can use a Cartesian coordinate system and then just define, you know, if you're doing 256 by 256 chips, um, then you can place it wherever within those chips uh, before you send it to your, to your training system. Um, if you're doing that, you'd probably want to save the geographic information outside into a, you know, a sidecar file and then load it in after you've, after you've uh, created your synthetic data. 
Um, is it next one? Yeah, so and finally, we put the, uh, the Sasquatch Im images in the worldview too. We added some detection boxes like you would find on an actual uh, AI algorithm, and voila, we detected Sasquatch. Um, so with these results, we can expand it to other interest areas too. You know, if we're building, um, as I mentioned, object detection stuff, we really need to understand how shadows are gonna affect the image. Um, you can run it through something like Blender or other game development engines and do some ray tracing and get you know, some really, really nice, as close to real world as possible training data. Um, this was just a, a fun little project, so we didn't go too far into that. But you have to consider things like tall buildings or trees and how are those are going to affect the illumination conditions of your training data. Um, if you're doing any, any spectral uh, work on the, uh, on the data, then you have to take that into consideration too. So if you're throwing in uh, an object like a car with a metal roof and the paint, what are the spectral profiles of that, of that paint color or that uh, metal and how those are going to affect your, your training data. So you got to think about that as well. Um, but luckily it can all be handled through things like X-ray and, uh, uh, and the notebooks to, to do some initial processing. Uh, and as I mentioned, we can also do some really fun things like uh, prove that the moon landing happened. Uh, so we just threw, threw the lunar, man, lunar lander on a uh, lunar reconnaissance orbiter image. Um, I didn't have time to get the little green men or else I would have put those on there as well. Uh, but hopefully this is not used for nefarious purposes and people don't start to think that we faked the moon landing. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed the talk. I heard, hope you learned a little bit about the cloud native stuff and you go research them some more. Again, there's lots of stack talks this week, so please go check them out. There's a couple of COG talks. Uh, and uh, I hope you had fun along the way. Thank you.